Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to see you so numerous, and I didn't expect anything less given the quality of our speakers today. Um, I am Simone Borghesi. I'm the director of uh, FSR Climate, the research group on climate change here at the European University Institute. And um, I'm introducing the session that is organized jointly with the School of Transitional Governance, represented by Jostel Beck here, and the European Association of Environmental and Resource Economists, I see Monica Eber in the audience. Um, when I saw that trust in the market was one of the topics suggested for the State of the Union this year, I thought that is perfect for an application to the special case, to the case of the European Emission Trading System. And that, so that's how the idea came about. And the background of the idea is based on two projects. One is a life side project that was awarded to FSR Climate and that was we just concluded in 2018 on the supporting implementation and development of the European Emission Trading System. Uh, within that project, last year in this room, we organized another side event at the State of the Union on equity and solidarity in the European Emission Trading System. Um, so, in a way, this can be considered as a follow-up of that event. The second origin, so to speak, of the session is the newly born Policy Outreach Committee of the European Association of Environmental and Resource Economists. Uh, last year in Gothenburg, uh, the President, Carlo Carraro, asked me to act as Secretary General of the Committee and Jostel Becker to be the Chairman of this Committee. And um, among the goals that you find on the web page of this Committee, there is uh, setting a more integrated dialogue between academia and policy the world and supporting, providing advice to the EU institutions, but also to international organizations, policy institutions in developing countries, and so on. So I thought that's a perfect context. The State of the Union is a perfect context to, uh, for a kickoff, for a um, kickoff meeting like this one. And so in a way, I would say that this event at the State of the Union this year is the sum also not necessarily a linear combination, but as some of the, these two previous uh, uh, projects. Uh, the Policy Outreach Committee is composed of 15 members, uh, well-known economists with long expertise, uh, uh, who gave an impact uh, in the field. Uh, 14 plus 1, probably. I feel an outlier here, but uh, um, this uh, a, a team of very expert uh, economists who can give a contribution in, to the policy dialogue. And in this sense, let me say that I think it's a bit as a, as a dream team, as the US dream team in 1992. Uh, now, as you know, that team was extremely successful, but sometimes dream team can fail. So <laughs> we will do our best because we have big challenges in front of us, in my view, and big questions to, to address. Some of the members of the, of the Dream Team, as I said, uh, are here today, and I would like to thank them all for being here. Some will be um, uh, connected because we are um, uh, live streaming the event. Uh, unfortunately, Carlo Carraro, the president of the European Association, who was supposed to be here, is ill and he couldn't make it. He was very sorry for that and he wrote us uh, this morning. But I have uh, some big names as uh, speakers and panelists. So I will, uh, we will have Otmar Edenhofer, the director of the Postal Institute for Climate Impact Research. Hermann Folleberg, who is professor at Tilburg University and senior research fellow at the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. And Martin Weizmann, whom I don't have to present, I think, but is professor of economics at Harvard and was before at MIT and Yale. And as panelists, uh, we have Dominique Bureau, who is the general delegate of the Economic Council of the French Ministry of Ecology. Uh, ben Groom, professor at uh, LSE and the researcher at the Grantham, 
Xavier Labandeira, professor at the University of Vigo and former director of FSR Climate, my predecessor here, and Aldo Ravazzi, who is the chief economist at DG Sustainable Development at the Italian Ministry of the Environment. You all have a very long list of affiliation, but you are also very well known, so I won't present you in details. Uh, forgive me, but I don't want to take time because I uh, prefer to go to the content and prefer to face you with the challenges that I was discussing at the beginning. So the question to, we are addressing today is trust is the, in the single market, and in particular, trust in the UETS. We all know that the EUTS had its ups and downs. I think this can be somehow visualized uh, by looking at the carbon price. When the carbon price fell below five euros per ton, well, basically, some people gave the EUTS uh, for debt, I would say, and trust was very low. But after the EU reform last year on phase four, expectations and trust seem to have uh, uh, re-emerged and uh, reinvigorating the system. Uh, as of Friday, on Friday the price was above 26 euros per ton. So this brings me to the questions that I want to pose on the table. What is the current level of trust by participants and public opinion in the UTS? What can be done to enhance this trust in the single market in the context of climate policy? What can transparency and MRV, so measurement, reporting, and verification, uh, contribute to build the trust in climate policy in general and in the UETS in particular? And looking at the international context, how can we trigger mutual trust across countries, especially in the context of the negotiations on Corsia and on Article 6 in the Paris Agreement? And more generally, what can we do as scholars, as researchers, as members of the Policy Outreach Committee to better bridge Policymaker with policymakers and enhance trust in climate policy measures. This will also be actually the topic of a policy session that we organize in Manchester at the next um, conference of the European Association entitled Policy and Academia Bridging the Gap. So that's really what we like to manage to do. A very ambitious target, I know. So let me pass on to to the coach of the team, to the chairman of the Policy Outreach Committee, Joost Delbecke, for a few words. Thank you very much, Simone, and good morning to all of you. I'm also very much thrilled to be part of this discussion today and over lunch. Um, first, uh, on the questions uh, uh, until lunch, and then after lunch, we uh, are going to discuss further what the POC, the Policy Outreach Committee, uh, could, uh, could do further. But there is one element that I would like to add to uh, what uh, Simone was just uh, mentioning, and that relates back uh, to the famous article by Martin Weizmann on uh, prices versus quantities, uh, because we saw the prices under the ETS you know, that are back at the level of uh, where they were in the first 10, 15 years. But when we calculate the emission reduction between the start of the system, 2005, and the latest validated figures, 2018, the emissions went down with 29%. And I think that nobody else uh, did uh, better in the past um, or in those years when we look at transport, when we look at households, when we look at agriculture, perhaps in the waste sector, but the waste sector is a tiny bit, while the ETS is uh, more or less 40-45% of emissions. So a 29 reduction, 29% reduction in not more than uh, 13 uh, years, I think is, is quite uh, uh, significant. And it brings us down to the question of trust, because other people in the world are looking at the ETS. We know that uh, the, 
that the Chinese, for example, are introducing a system that is very similar to the European system. And here in Florence, we have a Florence process. We have a debate where we have a debate with the Chinese, with the, uh, with the Californians, the New Zealanders, the Canadians, etc. And that is a very uh, welcome exchange of views behind closed doors. But it brings us back to the basic question that uh, Martin Weizmann already in 1974, if I have it right, was uh, putting on the table. Is it prices or is it quantities? That should be the start of the, the policy. So we are squarely in the debate uh, that was uh, uh, launched um, uh, already decades ago by uh, uh, Martin and, 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 and colleagues in the United States. So I will be the moderator of the discussion today. And uh, I would like uh, to invite the, the speakers uh, that were uh, announced to uh, give their thoughts, and I really would hope we can spare out some, uh, uh, some time for a free exchange of views uh, with all of you. But as we have a list of invited speakers, and as Otmar Edenhofer is uh, the first one uh, on, on the list, I would like to uh, ask uh, Otmar to, to give his uh, views on the trust question and the effectiveness, you know, how, how good are we in reducing emissions and is the system fit for purpose for the coming years, which is uh, very much uh, behind our questions. Um, um. So, Otmar, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. It's an enormous pleasure to be here and in particular to sit together with Martin and Jos and Simone on the, on the same panel. And you can see that Jos is an enormously generous person because we almost disagree on everything regarding emission threading scheme. Nevertheless, he has invited me. So you can see he is really a, a generous man. And we have always a very frank and a, a very lively debate on, on all this issue. The likelihood that we, dis we agree today is, is very low. But nevertheless, <laughs> let's, let's see what we can do. Now, I'm basically coming uh, in the middle of a debate in Germany about carbon pricing. Almost every day we had uh, on the first front pages of our newspapers a debate on carbon pricing, which is unprecedented in the German context, because as you know, Germans uh, usually do not discuss prices versus quantities. Uh, Germans like to talk about uh, uh, regulation and command and control. So we are Prussians in the end, and command and control is, is something which is at the heart of environmental policy. But this is now changing dramatically because of three reasons. The first one is a remarkable impact of the Friday for the Future uh, movement in Germany because the young people are on the streets and uh, basically they are really pushing the politicians to think about carbon pricing. And interesting enough, Friday for the Future basically ask for a carbon price which is consistent with the social costs of carbon. And this is quite remarkable. When I talked uh, one year ago with the politicians, almost every politician responded to my presentation on carbon pricing. You know, this is a very technocratic concept. Nobody will listen to you. Nobody will go on the street. Nobody understands why a carbon price and what is the social cost of carbon. Now, these young people are now on the street, and they say for Germany, the social cost of carbon is roughly around 180 euros per ton CO2, and therefore we ask for that. The second, uh, the second reason is it's the Coal Commission. As you basically might know that Germany is definitely a renewable country, but nevertheless, since 2011, Germany has invested in 10 new coal-fired plants. Our total emissions are from, uh, caused by, by coal-fired plants are higher than the emissions from Poland. So we had a coal commission, and the coal commission decides unilaterally uh, to phase out coal. Other countries like the Netherlands, like Italy, like Spain, are also thinking about the phase out of coal. And definitely, there is an emerging debate in Poland about the coal issue. So the unilateral issue is now on the table. And the third and very, very important aspect why carbon pricing in Germany becomes so important has to do with Europe. It is all about the European effort sharing regulation. You also might know that from 2021 on, Every member state in the European Union has to fulfill 
annually to keep the emissions within a, a, a very well specified budget uh, for transport, uh, for buildings and heat, uh, heating and agriculture. And if basically the member states cannot fill, fulfill these obligations, they have to buy permits from other countries in the European Union. So now Germany is calculating what might be the price on this market. It's not a market between companies, it's a market between governments, but nevertheless there is a huge financial risk for the German finance minister and I assume for other finance ministers in the European Union also. If you calculate basically a carbon price for transport, uh, for heating and for agriculture roughly around 50 euros per ton CO2, this has an implication. It is basically a financial risk annually of three million billions for the German finance minister and accumulated for a whole decade it's 30 million. So this is quite significant and therefore we have in Germany this debate about carbon pricing. That's quite interesting and what I will do is basically I would like to start when we talk about the trust issue uh, I would like to talk about two aspects here. The first aspect is the very well-known water bed effect and uh, the relationship between the water bed effect in the end, the market stability reserve and the minimum price and probably this is the strongest disagreement with yours because I am advocating to enhance the trust within the European emission setting scheme to implement the minimum price. I know this is not so easy but it is, it is important to mitigate the water bed effect but also the other regulatory uh, uncertainties. So this will be my, my arguments. And this, if, if we would have basically a stabilized system, a stabilized unified uh, uh, European emissions trading scheme, this would help us also to implement the right policies for the European effort sharing regulation. Because then we have a chance that we have basically a minimum price in the European emissions trading scheme for power market but also we can then basically also implement a minimum price via taxes, via an emissions trading scheme nationally, where we could basically send a unified or a, a single uh, carbon price to, to our sectors. And this is basically the debate now in Germany. Now let me, let me start basically to, to say a few things about the market stability reserve because it seems to me that the market stability reform or that the market stability reserve is not very well understood in the, in the current debate. Um, there's, a, uh, of course, um, uh, some analysis showing that basically uh, we will have now a, a high fraction of cancellation and uh, after in 2030, so there will be less uh, 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 permits cancelled coming from the market stability reserve. But it seems to me this is a little bit misleading because we have to understand when we talk about carbon leakage, we have carbon leakage over space and over time. And my argument will be that in the end, the market stability reserve can only address and will only address uh, the, uh, uh, the water bed effect or basically the carbon leakage over time. The two other channels, the emission leakage, where basically uh, when the price in the emissions trading scheme is declining, so then there's a shift in production to the more CO2 incentive countries, so that's the emission leakage. Then there's another leakage which is transmitted by the, not by the emission trading scheme, but by the power market, where basically you have a change in the fuel prices, and the fuel prices basically makes then, or can make CO2 intensive uh, technologies even more competitive. And then there's the third one. This is basically uh, the carbon leakage over time. And this is about banking. And let me explain this a little bit, the interaction between this two dimension and what can the market stability reserve deliver when we analyze this. So this is a quite, uh, um, a quite um, general uh, uh, and a quite conceptual uh, remark. So let, let, us, let me start at uh, T1, uh, which basically sees that we have additional abatement, let's say additional abatement in Germany because of the phase out of coal. 
If you phase out coal, so the electricity price will increase. If the electricity price is increasing, then the remaining coal-fired plants become more competitive. And also, uh, basically, the price in the emission strings can will decline. And therefore, we have, again, the second waterbed effect in space. So this does not mean that the waterbed effect in space will necessarily cancel out the fuel additional abatement. But what does this mean is basically without the market stability reserve, something is in the bank, so to say. So then we have the next period. In the next period, again, we have some additional abatement. We have some waterbed effect in space transmitted by the emissions trading scheme or by the power system. And then basically the emissions trading, the price in the emissions trading scheme is increasing. And now it comes to an interesting effect. When the price is increasing, so then some of the allowances in the bank will be used again in the market. And here it comes to the most important aspect here. The market stability uh, reserve cancellation only reduces the red area over the blue area. So this will be reduced by the market stability reserve. And then there will be uh, a, sorry, there will be a remaining allowances in, in the market. When the price is not high enough, so then the cancellation will be reduced. So this is the working mechanism of, the, of basically the banking system. And here you can see basically what kind of surplus the market stability reserves can address. Now let me move from this more conceptual level to the more empirical level. So what we have done here in Germany, we decided that we want to phase out coal. And this is the trajectory after 2033. We will phase out roughly 12 gigawatt of coal-fired plant, and this is basically then uh, the reduction profile uh, by 2038, which basically then we will end the use of, of, of coal. Here you can see basically the coal emissions in 2016 in Germany, in Poland. So Germany has uh, uh, almost uh, the factor two higher coal emissions than Poland. Other countries like Italy, Spain have also some coal emissions at the lower level, but nevertheless, there's also a debate in these countries about the coal phase out. Now, what we have done here is to provide a numerical simulation. So, what is the impact of the uh, market stability, what is the impact of the German coal phase out when there is no cancellation of the permits? And there's a huge debate in Germany if we should in the end cancel the, the permits because the German finance minister is absolutely not eager to do this because he is afraid that uh, he will lose revenues and therefore there is a debate and a fight between the environmental ministry and the finance ministry to what extent the, uh, the, the permit should be cancelled. So what will happen then here is uh, you can see basically a decline of emissions in the German electricity uh, 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 system but then there have, you have in the other EU countries an increasing emissions of electricity emissions. So this is transmitted by the electricity market. You have a higher electricity price, which makes coal in other countries more competitive. The blue one is the industry. And then you can basically see the net change. So the net change is basically driven by the waterbed effect, which is not alleviated by the market stability reserve. In addition to that, the, the uh, a permit price drops, and therefore this reduces the market stability reserve cancellation. So in the worst case scenario, uh, it turns out that the water bed effect is even larger than 100%. In this calculation, it is roughly around 118%, admittedly, if there is no cancellation. The problem is that the cancellation profile is determined endogenously by the market forces and by the market prices. And therefore, it is very hard to calculate the right quantity. And therefore, my argument will be that it would be good if we could have a minimum price in the European system, be it implemented as a European-wide minimum price. I am fully aware about the constitutional problems here. Or it could be, uh, like in the UK, a, um, a flexible, a, a flexible uh, fee uh, in addition to the, uh, to the market permit price uh, within the coalition of the willing. And this uh, minimum price could basically allow to a certain extent unilateral action without undermining the trust in the system. 
<coughs> the second component, and this has nothing to do with the water bed effect, so I should come to an end, but uh, I will be very, in a, in a few minutes, come to an end. The second aspect on the trust issue is, so what is the reason for the price decline? What was the reason for the price decline in the European Emissions Trading Scheme? So we have undertaken a few empirical studies, and it turns out that 90% of the price decline in the past was not driven by the market fundamentals. It was driven by the expectations. So where this other, does this other 90% come from? It comes from basically from the destabilization of the uh, coming caused by the political decisions. So I would portray in the past the UETS as a betting shop for political decisions instead of a marketplace to figure out what are the most competitive technologies. Now, I admit that in the past we have seen now a significant increase in the price, which this basically implies that there is an increasing trust in the system. But again, this trust could be easily undermined when there are a surplus, when there are political decisions, when there is business cycle impacts or Brexit or whatever, and therefore, in order to ensure and enhance the trust into the system, in an intertemporal setting, a minimum price could also help. Why could it help? Because uh, a minimum price basically uh, creates an incentive uh, to undertake investments in abatement earlier and therefore enhance the, um, uh, the, the credibility in the long-term uh, long target. So this is what I would like to say. Uh, basically, because of unilateral action and because of the long-term credibility, a minimum price in the European Emissions Trading Scheme would be important. In addition to that, when basically now the European member states try to implement the European Effort Sharing Scheme, a minimum price in the power system could help to implement either a tax scheme or an additional national emission trading scheme for transport, heat and agriculture, uh, so that in the, in the sect, in the, across the sectors we have almost a, a clear signal, a one price signal across the sectors, which could help Europe and the member states uh, to transform their economies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Otmar. A, a very clear recommendation because of the water bed effect. Uh, you know, I'm not going to repeat the particularities, but uh, it's part of a market system that there is a water bed effect. You know, you reduce here, you increase there. Uh, so, but your message is very clearly to enhance trust, we need to stipulate an explicit minimum price. And I uh, would uh, recommend the following speakers to react on the previous speakers. And I, I'm sure that Martin, uh, on my right hand side, is going to have uh, thoughts on this. But the next speaker is, before you come on, uh, on stage, Martin, is Herman Volleberg uh, from uh, Tilburg. Herman, um, we are eager to have your views on how to improve the trust in the ETS. Thank you, Jos, for uh, being here and uh, being invited to this uh, interesting um, event. Um, we both share a very long history in, in, in carbon pricing in, in Europe. I remember that we even started to discuss that in the, 90, uh, the early 1990s. And, um, on taxes. On taxes, you. exactly. And I'm going to say a lot about taxes and the interaction with uh, tradable permits. Um, like Germany, uh, as usually, we are a bit ahead of Germany uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the funny thing is that we, we also have an enormous discussion on carbon taxation, uh, and that is embedded in a, in a whole uh, discussion on climate agreements, which is a sort of um, a national kind of stakeholders in engagement, uh, which is going on now for one and a half year. Um, and we're trying in the Netherlands to organize trust, basically, in, uh, in climate policy. And the reason for this uh, event is that the Netherlands is a bit um, uncomfortable with, uh, with the, the, the speed of the European Union in terms of taking uh, care of the Paris Agreement. Uh, maybe I can can have the, the to push the button in some way. I don't know. Uh, I, I can do that here. Okay, great. Yeah, that's right. So if we're talking about trust, because I, I find the questions quite uh, 
quite tense uh, and uh, to be honest also very relevant um, so I started to think okay how can I make something out of this question on trust and relate that to the choice of instruments and of course as economists we, we always uh, pose that type of questions in terms of okay uh, uh, prices versus quantities or taxes versus tradable permits uh, and to be honest I don't believe in that anymore uh, I think if you look at the big picture and you look at the real world um, uh, it's always a complement. We are using complements in terms of prices and quantities and I will explain that and there is a big interesting observation I, can, uh, I have made from my experience the last uh, period on, on how we perceive taxes and how we perceive tradable permits. So the question is about trust is who are you going to ask? Is it the general public? Is that uh, the yellow jackets? Is it climate skeptics? Uh, we, we see a rise of climate skepticism within in the Netherlands. I think as a result of the whole discussion on climate uh, policy uh, in the Netherlands um, nowadays. Uh, if you are asking large firms, you get a very different answer than from the small medium enterprises and the NGOs have their own perceptions. So we, we have very many uh, different perceptions and trust is not a, a, simple, a simple thing. Now if you look at, at carbon pricing in particular, um, and you look at uh, carbon taxes or energy taxes, uh, going back to the 1990s and, and the EU not delivering any, any effort actually in terms of a carbon price uh, already in the 1990s, the, the Netherlands decided, okay, if, if it's not going to happen uh, within in Europe, we do a unilateral action and in 1996 we introduced the energy tax in the Netherlands, which is basically a sort of carbon tax. It's a, a tax on gas and it was a tax on electricity and uh, at a considerable level and nowadays I will show you in a minute. It's a serious kind of, uh, of tax system which we already have uh, as a result of, of the EU not delivering anything in the tax uh, uh, area. Interestingly enough, in the, in the early 2000s, uh, Jos uh, came up with a very smart idea and maybe we should try tradable permits and within, within a year uh, we, we have this system uh, and we're observing this system now and I think uh, that is interesting to observe. So uh, basically, if you look at taxes, uh, there's a, always distrust in taxes. People don't like to pay taxes. Uh, the yellow jackets is just an example. Um, and it's, it's representing a sort of coalition of the unwilling. Uh, people are claiming, okay, why uh, should we pay a tax and, and, and the, the firms don't pay any tax. Uh, and then, of course, on the other side, if you look at, uh, at the tradable permit system, the interesting thing is that it's not a tax. It's working on emissions directly. Uh, and it's, uh, it's working on firms, but people don't know. Uh, it's, if, if you talk with people, even uh, involved economists in the Netherlands, uh, to my surprise, were not aware always of, uh, about the tradable permit system, that the firms already were paying in terms of a, of a tradable permit scheme. So it's, it seems that it's, in terms of trust, it's only a, a kind of system which is, is for specialists uh, and, and it's not uh, known to the general public. Even now, if we are, dis we are discussing the, the carbon tax issue, it's, it's, it's for the firms, it's even difficult for them to, to claim that they are already doing something. Of course, the, the, the permits are for free which is, uh, I think, uh, one of the big uh, problems we have in the system. Uh, we are auctioning to the electricity firms, but not to the, uh, to the industry. And, and this is a kind of thing where we, where we should uh, look more carefully at. Um, but in that sense, firms are right. Uh, they are already part of a scheme which is, uh, is doing something. Um, at the same time, I also observe that the ETS, even within the Dutch discussion, doesn't play a role at all. And that's something which we should observe as well. So it, it's, it's not in the wide public, but also within the ministries I didn't observe. I'm very much involved in this whole discussion. There's not anybody talking most of the time about the European training system, which is, I think, something uh, uh, surprising, but it does happen. And if we are talking about it, it's always the same uh, message, the price is too low. So the question is, does the EU ETS deliver? I think Jos already mentioned something in terms of, okay, we are doing uh, quite well. I'm always defending, so I'm on the other side, I think, also of Otmar. I do think that the ETS delivers because there's a cap. In the end, there is a cap. And uh, all discussions um, which we have, we have a quantity cap, and the quantity cap will bring us somewhere. somewhere. The linear reduction factor has been uh, reduced. Um, and you see this on the, on the picture. Um, that may be not enough, but it's still there, and the cap will deliver in the end, uh, as long as we stick to the system. 
than the MSR. I totally disagree with uh, Otmar's uh, perception. Uh, of course, there's a sort of waterbed type of effect in terms of leakage. Um, that is that there uh, may be import substitution or there may be some kind of other mechanisms where firms may, may relocate if you do something locally. Uh, but in the end, if we look at, uh, at, the, uh, at, the, at the way in which the bank was uh, constructed uh, and the MSR is trying to reduce the bank, uh, in terms of uh, cancellation of emission rights, uh, if you take an integral over the time, I cannot see otherwise than that the cap is going to be smaller because of uh, all, the, all the rules which have been imposed in the market stability rules. So even uh, if we look at, at the integral of, of, of the total amount of permits, uh, in my view, uh, it will be reduced uh, because of the MSR. Uh, and of course, there are, there are many uh, details in the discussion, but I, I won't uh, like to discuss them now. But in my view, the waterbed effect is temporarily uh, will be punctured, and there's quite some dis of agreement on, on that this uh, this is going to happen. And it's it also, I think, uh, nicely fits the picture of the prices in, in terms of, of of the price mechanism and how uh, we look at at what the prices are doing. You you're claiming that 90% is mis is not uh, to be uh, uh, understood by market fundamentals. I see it a bit different. Uh, in my view, we can easily explain that um, if we take a, a proper uh, regional expectations framework and uh, we can we can then more or less uh, see what um, yeah more or less reconstruct what is going on. Uh, but anyway. That's that is, uh, I think, food for specialists. In my view, um, if we go back to the trust question, um, I think it very much depends on your expectations of the system. And the perception is that the system does not deliver. If, if you ask, for instance, an NGO, they say, ah, oh, it's too little, the price is too low, and it's too late for the Paris Agreement. And this is, of course, something which has to do about the cap. So maybe the cap is not going down fast enough. Uh, but that's something different than, than the instrument and the working of the instrument itself. So we should really separate the goal in terms of the cap and uh, the workings of the instrument. So if we do look at the cap, then it does deliver for the ETS sectors anyway. And the MSR adaptation may even render the minimum price uh, redundant. In our simulations, uh, the, the minimum price is not doing uh, so much anymore unless you are raising it, it to very high degrees. Then, of course, it's still, it's, it will be still there. But then you're basically substituting a cap system for the minimum for for a price system, and I would say, okay, if you are not satisfied with the cap, then the best thing you could do is is reduce the linear reduction scheme even further, um, uh, because indeed, from the from the pairs perspective, it may be too low, uh, too loose, and uh, then then that's the proper thing to do, and you will see immediately a reaction of the market. That's exactly what we have seen at the end of 2017. Um, yes, if. We now look at, at, uh, at the discussions on, on taxes and, uh, and, and, and carbon uh, pricing. Uh, I think it's, it's worthwhile to look at this picture for a minute. Um, what the picture tells us is the complete view. So um, in the different uh, non-ETS sectors on the left-hand side and the ETS sectors on the right-hand side. So on the left-hand side, we see transport, agriculture, and the built environment. And on the right-hand side, you see industry and electricity. Then with this picture in hand, you can explain and understand a lot of the discussions going on. So we see, for instance, industry uh, having a rel relatively low price, but being uh, 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 looking at the minimum price, of, sorry, not at the minimum price, but at the pricing scheme um, with, with their grandfathered permits, but it's basically on the, on the whole uh, um, uh, number of, of emissions which are in, in that system. Electricity system is the same. And then uh, in the other fields, like transport and the built environment, we see high taxes, high implicit taxes in the Netherlands. And this is not uh, specific to the Netherlands. We see it everywhere. So if people are discussing carbon taxes, they usually are discussing carbon taxes in the non-ETS sectors. There is no country in the world at this time, which is discussing an a tax in the industry. So the Netherlands is now the first country which has a very serious engagement in a carbon tax for the industry. And this is in the middle of the Dutch debate, uh, which is, I think, very interesting to, to look at. But it has something to do with perceptions and trust. Um, and economists should be careful, uh, because they sometimes contribute to the, to the fuss. 
I'm not, I don't have enough time to explain it. I will say something on this, on this trust building using climate coalitions because that's, that's I think, in, in that sense, Otmar and, and I very much agree. I cannot show, uh, because of the time limits, uh, much about what's going on, but in the Netherlands, the, the basic feeling is that some unilateral action should, be, uh, should help us uh, and we should uh, coordinate on, on schemes which, which help let's say, a, a sort of coalition of the willing within the EU uh, in terms of a sort of two-speed EU or whatever uh, in the, in the before, uh, in, instead of waiting until 2030 for a new uh, option to, to, uh, to change the climate package, we should do something earlier. Um, and again, the industry is here uh, one of the main targets in the Dutch discussion. Uh, I cannot say much about what's, what's going on, but uh, a lot of stuff is going on in the Netherlands. Uh, here is the example of what, what is being planned uh, nowadays on the climate agreement that includes a minimum price in the electricity uh, system, that includes a discussion on a tax or uh, a minimum price or whatever scheme uh, within uh, the industrial system. It has adaptations in the non-ETS sectors and overall I think it's, it's, it's a nice package uh, to look at and it also includes of course uh, uh, the coal power plants to be closed. Um, the findings of our studies in this area show that there's no kind of, uh, let's say, uh, free lunch. Uh, it's always uh, something uh, where we have to, uh, to look at trade-offs. The leakage can be high, for instance, for a tax, uh, and it can even be negative for a buy and cancel policy, um, uh, which is positive in a sense. Eh? So uh, a buy and, and cancel policy means that you buy today and you, uh, you cancel them, uh, and because of the MSR it works very well uh, in the short run and not after 2025. Uh, a tax reduces actually an ETS price, yeah. and interventions raise that price, so you see all kinds of mechanisms into that, that system which, uh, which uh, are uh, creating some kind of um, trade-off. To summarize, the EU is locked into ETS and it should cope with its potential shortcomings. That's, that's my main point. Carbon pricing for ETS sectors, electricity and industry is settled basically uh, and it does not compromise the trust of the general public because the polluter pays and I think that's a very important thing and we should maybe communicate that better. Impatience should be tackled preferably by adapting the cap in my view um, and it is no longer clear, also in the short run at least, that the minimum price is still necessary. Uh, I think the cancellation policy, and there's also a very interesting paper on that by uh, Gerlach and Heijmans, uh, which show in, uh, in, in, the, in the Weizmann framework, to say it that way, uh, that, it's, that it's indeed that, uh, not so very clear that um, we need an additional minimum price. Building climate coalitions of the willing, I think, is the only proper answer uh, to build trust uh, against the drawbacks of globalization. I think we should care much more about that uh, as economists uh, than we did uh, before and uh, two-speed solutions are of course second best but are still effective and less costly than unilateral action and within those coalitions we should make separate uh, policies uh, active in terms of uh, addressing distributional impacts. So um, I think that closes my contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Herman. I, I think uh, Another uh, view, it's uh, taking up some of the elements that Otmar has been addressing, but I think you are milder in, 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 in saying what, uh, what uh, needs to be done. Uh, I think uh, on the coalitions of the willing, uh, it's certainly an area where we could have uh, a discussion on, because that's the super waterbed effect. If a coalition of the willing is doing more, then others have to do less within the same cap because the cap is European-wide defined. Sure. So we run again in, in, into trouble. But let's uh, park that uh, for the debate. Martin Weizmann is the f next one on my list. Martin, now you have heard the, the uh, European debate. You know, we have an ETS, but we have some you know, preferences as well for, for a tax. Uh, or tax elements indeed, and I'm, I'm very eager to hear how you, uh, you know, uh, react to what you just heard. On the one hand, there are emission reductions. On the other hand, there is this nervousness. Are we prepared for what is still to come? You know, the challenges 2030, 2050. You have the floor, Martin, and really pleased that you can be with us today. Thank you. Um, I have some brief comments on Otmar and Hermann's uh, presentation. They are brief. Uh, for Otmar, maybe the California experience teaches us something. Uh, 
The, uh, I know uh, many of the participants in the California cap and trade system, many of them, and uh, uh, to a person, they regret that they ever got involved in cap and trade. What they have, it, it, the price fluctuates too much, and they had to put in a price floor and a price ceiling, so-called price collars. Uh, but the, what, what turned out was that uh, 95 or 98 percent of the time was hitting up against either the price ceiling or the price floor. And uh, they regret that they ever somehow got involved in this cap and trade thing. Uh, it would have been better to, for California to put in a tax. So that was their uh, experience, uh, I know from personal interaction uh, with many of them. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, for Herman, the, the cap and, and it, people are aware uh, <laughs> now uh, that uh, a cap and trade system involves real payments and sometimes it's derogatorily referred to as a cap and tax system. So, uh, uh, as Abraham Lincoln said, you can fool all of the people some of the time, and you can fool um, uh, some of the people all of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. And uh, people are, I, I, as a whole, well aware that the, this cap and trade system to, to work effectively has a, ta a, a tax-like element uh, at the end of the day. So the, you know, the industry is well aware of this for what it's worth. Um, with Herman, uh, I, I guess that's my comment that the, that the uh, 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 people are aware of this tax-like element to a uh, to a cap and trade system. I think that's our experience. That's the experience in California. That's the experience in many other places. I wanted to, for a minute now, or a couple of minutes, stand back and pat ourselves on the back as economists, because we have done something quite remarkable. I think. That is the idea of pricing carbon, which is out there, which we were discussing today. Um, this has come a long way. Economists were always, uh, it, it, it started with Pagu, a famous British economist in, in 1920. So it's almost 100 years, 99 years since Pagu put forth his idea. And his idea was that you should, uh, the, pro, the economically best way, we all know this story now, to uh, deal with a bad externality like pollution is to tax it and that that addresses many problems at once. Uh, that filters out uh, the uh, a uniform uh, tax on pollution, filters out the high polluters and filters in the low polluters or low polluter technologies. Uh, and um, this was, so it's been 100 years since this idea was introduced and it, from the very beginning, as I looked into this to some extent, it, it, economists were unilaterally in favor of this. Uh, they, they're now unanimously in favor uh, of a, uh, a price on carbon, for example, as witnessed by the fact that over 4,000 U.S. economists and other notables just recently, including myself for what is worth, signed on a petition uh, to put a uh, uniform tax on, on carbon. Uh, so 4,000 US economists to me is pretty close to unanimity. And when Pagu introduced this idea, again, this was un near unanimous among economists that this is the best way to do it. But it was, in, it was not in the public domain. The public had no idea of, of these theories and they, they seemed very far-fetched at the time. But economists were in favor of it. They wrote about it in their textbooks. They uh, taught it in their economics courses. They discussed it, uh, th their common agreement with each other, but it was not in the public domain. Now, a hundred years later, 
Creator, look how far we have come. And I think we should keep, we should, we, it's time out to pat ourselves on the back. Uh, because for the first 50 years or so, again, it had unanimous consent among economists, unanimous approval, but it was not in the public domain. Since then, it has migrated into the public domain. So it started off as an academic idea, had unanimity among economists, but unanimity in economists' voice is a powerful force. Uh, history has shown that many, many times. And here it came into its own, and so through the 19. 20s, 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, well, maybe into the 70s, this was not in the public domain. Then it started to migrate over to the public domain. And to the extent that now, I don't want to say everybody, but people are well aware of the idea of pricing carbon, as this is witness uh, uh, to. And um, uh, they are well aware that economists favor this. Uh, so um, I think uh, we should uh, we, we should pat ourselves on the back as economists. We we introduced this message. We kept on pressing it. It took a while, but it has now come into its own in the public uh, in the public domain. So I want to pat ourselves on the back as economists from this historical point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Martin and. Uh, uh, I think what you did in the United States with the statement that has been signed by more than 4,000 economists, I think is really remarkable and helpful. And if you could repeat something uh, from the European perspective, that would be uh, very useful. Of course, the number of questions would be very different uh, because we have now an ETS and you know, we have to build from there. Uh, but we come to that debate uh, um, uh, in, in a moment. Just a reaction on what you said on California and the price floor and the price uh, ceiling. Um, if we take back where the prices were fluctuating under the ETS, let's not forget the big recession that we were going through following Lehman Brothers. If we would have had a price uh, floor that would have been relatively high, would the system have survived that? That, that is a basic question that I have as a policymaker because we, well, of course, we hate the wild price fluctuation that we saw between, say, 5 and 20 euros, more or less. Uh, that's big. But the crisis following Lehman Brothers was big. It is the biggest one we had since the Second World War. So if we would not have had that extreme price flexibility, would the system not have hit the barriers or the... Um, the, 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 the uh, limits of its ex acceptability. I would like to throw it in the, in the middle for the, the next interventions uh, because price fluctuation, uh, we should look at it from different uh, points of view. Uh, certainty, but also flexibility. You know, that's, that's what is in the, in the notion of it. So, I have the next uh, list of uh, speakers um, that I would like to see Dominique Bureau. Uh, to, to enlighten us about uh, so what you heard so far. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I shall not try to explain why I do agree with the three previous speakers, because it's quite complicated. And I shall only try to, to make two comments uh, about the two topics. The first one is specifically about the credibility of the EU ETS. And the second is uh, about carbon pricing and the, the acceptability of carbon pricing. Uh, on the first one, uh, it's clear that, that the reform that has been uh, made in uh, last year is a very important reform and uh, a good, uh, good reform. However, uh, the level of prices, uh, the level of price uh, on the EU ETS will remain too low to, uh, on the short term, for a quick uh, switch uh, towards uh, from coal, and in the long term, to to induce innovation. And I think that 
Of course, it's not, clear for, it's not clear from a theoretical point of view that we need an additional instrument. If we had a perfect MSR and a perfect level of cap, probably uh, it would be sufficient. But I think that we must address the political economy problem. I think that the cap is the fact that the cap has been uh, uh, always too, too high is structural, I think, with the political economy to make, ac to make acceptable the cap by uh, firms, indeed. And I think that the MSR is also weak. Uh, the credibility of MSR is weak in the long term and not sufficient to provide uh, an answer about the long-term price of the carbon on the ETS. What is the, what is the most important after the switch from coal? The most important is to, uh, to guide innovation and in, uh, we, we need instruments to, to have an answer about the expectation of the long-term price. The problem when you make an investment, a green investment, is not the spot price of the uh, ETS, it is uh, the, the long-term price and the expected long-term price. So I think that we must address carefully. So I think that uh, we need a price price. So I want just to add an argument. In France, as you know, we have problem to establish a carbon price higher for uh, ESR, effort sharing regulation sector, that is to, for domestic. What we have to do to, to, to achieve the goals for our domestic emission, we need to put a price, a carbon price, which is higher than the price on the ETS. And this is not acceptable for the households. They say, why I should pay uh, 50 euros, uh, in, in, indeed our, uh, our carbon price is 44 euros uh, today. But they ask, why to, to, to pay uh, 50, uh, 50 euros, for the carbon on the ETS, it's 20. Why? So I think that we, we must uh, have in mind that the, the level of price, explicit or shadow price of uh, domestic policies must be uniform. And so there we have a problem. The level we have made an uh, uh, important step to, to restore a significant level on the EU ETS but it is not sufficient uh, to, to have a consistent to achieve our two, uh, 2030 goals. So, and uh, I think uh, just, I think it's a moment, it's, it's, at, it's time to discuss that because it's clear that the la two, two last years, when people, uh, people in favor of a shadow pr uh, of a price floor were indeed often people who were against cap and trade systems, mechanisms. But it's not today we have a window because the, the price on the, on the EU ETS is quite credible and so it's, a moment, it's time to, to establish more firmly the credibility of the carbon price of, on the EU ETS and so we must be pragmatic to combine a price floor and EU ETS MSR. I think that we have a, a big problem with uh, politi political economy and credibility of the, the mechanism in its, uh, in its all. And so we must be pragmatic to combine instruments and not to be too ideological be with uh, price versus quantities. To, <laughs> to uh, my second point is uh, about the, how we try to, to make the public uh, uh, to, to make the public uh, agree with uh, carbon pricing. I think that the public indeed understands the mechanism of prices. It's not so clear with politicians sometimes, but I think that uh, we explain. Uh, uh, indeed, they do not, when they say, I don't trust that pricing, that prices are working, they say that they don't want to pay, but uh, they know that elas price elasticities uh, do, do exist. Uh, but I think that, uh, we must, of course, we must uh, provide positive explanations of the functioning of economic instruments. But we need also to make, uh, to disseminate information and disclosure about the real performance of alternative instruments 
which is sometimes very bad. And so uh, we say carbon pricing is good, but we don't tackle the fact that the uh, alternative instruments are bad. I, I just want to, to finish with two examples. For example, um, just I uh, said that uh, minus 29%, it's not counterfactual, and uh, perhaps there is a leakage in that. But uh, indeed, we have evidence that uh, EU ETS, when we compare firms with similar positions inside and outside ETS, we have evidence, econometric evidence, that ETS has worked. We have also evidence that uh, ETS, with a low, low price, has induced more, uh, more innovation, more uh, action for innovation uh, than uh, no ETS. So I think that we can provide more, use academic evidence to, to, uh, to give uh, more uh, uh, solidity to our uh, recommendation. And on the other side, I take a franchise, which is a, a price, but a limited price, uh, an error base which is our bonus malus on uh, cars. We have uh, established a uh, bonus malus. Indeed, uh, very big impact on the unit emission of the new fleet, but econometric evidence is uh, no reduction em of emission because rebrand effects, and because the bonus malus was uh, unbalanced, and thus there was globally a subsidy to road, and when you combine all the elements, the result was, uh, was, uh, was uh, increased emissions of somewhat, which looked like a good, uh, a good uh, so I think that we, we, to progress, we must also uh, say that the performance of some uh, several instruments are really bad. Thank you, Dominique, and, and, and thank you also for uh, raising uh, the fact that while ETS prices were low. The expectation of higher prices in the future uh, was nevertheless or was acting as an incentive for innovation, innovation that needs to be brought about and takes a long time to mature. Uh, so uh, that, that incentive was clearly there. Uh, let's move on to Ben Groom. Um, ben, uh, we are thrilled to, uh, to have the UK perspective uh, on all this, and we are very sad to see you leaving. So we would rather prefer you stay in the ETS, perhaps, uh, um, if you would have any thoughts on that. Uh, you know. Thank you. The bigger the ETSs are, the more effective they are. That's what we learned from, from Martin and colleagues. Yeah. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, so we're well, very um, great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so some very interesting uh, talks that we just had there on the issue of trust in the uh, in the uh, ETS, um, and it, I, I, I would, you would expect me to agree with Marty, of course. But I think uh, patting ourselves on the back in some respects is is um, is a very important consideration. Um, from Otmar's presentation, we learned that there's been a 29% reduction as a consequence of the ETS scheme, which is some measure of success. And in the UK, for instance, um, with the debates concerning Brexit and so forth, uh, when you confront... There's arguments on the left for leaving the European Union, and there's even a phrase, Lexit, which, which describes that group of feeling uh, about the European Union. And one of the arguments that they typically use is, you know, what has the European Union ever done for climate change, right? And so when you explain, I, you know, I have friends who take this position, we have friends who are probably part of the, um, the movements, Fridays for the Future and Extinction Rebellion and so forth, and when you confront them with these, uh, these facts, they're very surprised. They're very surprised that there have been some successes. So I think, as well as giving ourselves a pat on the back, it's also worthwhile as publicising the uh, the impacts of these programmes. Which, in, even if people have heard of carbon pricing, they may not have heard of the successes of these instruments. So that's one thing I, I, I'd like. To, uh, one comment I have on the presentation so far. The other th the other thing I would say is that we've had different definitions of trust in the presentations that uh, that we've seen. So I mean, Otmar's was very a clinical definition, it's a minimum price. 
That's what we need to get trust in the ETS system. With Herman, Herman asked the question, trust in who or from whom? And that's also a very important question. Is it trust by politicians and government in, in these instruments? Or is it trust from the, from the broader public that's important here? So in the UK, um, a measure of the trust that, 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 that we have in a sense in the ETS scheme is the fact that in the, in the UK we have the Climate Act. This is a piece of legislation from 2008 which says we, uh, as, a, as a government, as a, as a country, have to meet a particular reductions target in uh, climate emissions. And how are we going to do that? Well, we have carbon pricing of regulatory change and infrastructure development in, in central government guidelines. We use the abatement cost for traded emissions. That's the emissions price. We use that in central government appraisal. If for non-traded emissions, we look at the abatement cost. So in that sense, as a measure of the trust in, trust in that system, we're using this mechanism inside government to guide invest, government investments and, and our pathway to meeting those legislated targets. So that's interesting. Uh, and on the other side, and we heard from, from Dominique there, the importance of thinking about the impact on people who are paying these prices. That's not, not only industry, but also members of the public. So whether it's a carbon tax or an ETS scheme that we're looking at here, I would say that part of the issue of trust is, is very much in, in fairness and the distribution, being mindful of the distributional effects of these policies. So a couple of things on, on that. Um, of course, if the distributional effects are important and we've seen sort of responses to climate, pr uh, ch climate um, carbon pricing in various countries have been negative in some sense. And so policymakers need to be mindful of building trust in these, these instruments by being mindful of the distributional effects. Another thing about that is that the distributional effects are different depending on which country we're talking about. So uh, if you look at the academic literature on the distributional effects of carbon pricing, most of it comes from the USA. And the USA is a country which is, has a very unequal income distribution. It's a country where you're quite likely to find regressive effects of such policies. Similarly, the tram transport system is, is very car-based and public transport is not a big thing in the US. So again, that is more likely to lead to regressive types, evidence of regressiveness of these policies. In other countries, it's very different. If you look at the impact in Sweden, for instance, when the carbon tax was introduced in, the, in uh, 1990, uh, the um, income distribution in, in Sweden is much more equal. In fact, by the best estimates, the impact of that was, uh, was progressive. So as, as policy makers and academics, again, we need to be able to be conversant in this typical criticism of carbon pricing, that it's a regressive thing. And we need to be conversant in these academic studies which tell you, look, that is very contextual. It depends on the, on the economy, economy that you're dealing with. So that's one thing. And the other final question to, um, final point to make on, on the distributional effects is, would be regressive compared to what? And so work by Don Fullerton and others in the US, again, shows that, that uh, even if carbon pricing has regressive effects, it's much less than those under command and control and other kind of rigid, non-market-based um, instruments. So that's what I would say in terms of, uh, of um, trust. Trust is about fairness also. Thank you very much uh, for making that point. And I think on the distributional effects and impacts, what is uh, uh, commonly forgotten is that the distribution of the ETS allowances has a major correction according to, uh, to those who face a bigger transformation process. So they, the well-known you know, uh, situation in Poland, for example, uh, very much reliant on coal, they are getting more carbon allowances, but they have to invest them in alternatives and cleaner solutions. So they cannot just continue business as usual. There are uh, 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 conditions and, and, and restrictions uh, related to that. So very important point indeed. Uh, without that, we would never have had a European system. Let's face up to the political reality uh, of that as well. Javier, um, uh, I'm, I'm sure you have uh, uh, additional uh,
comments to, uh, to make to, to what was brought to the table. We have already a rich menu, but uh, you have the floor. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, Jos, uh, Simone, it's an honor to, to be here. And it's a difficult position because with this panel, you know, we have Marty Weitzman, one of the biggest uh, academics working in the, in the field. Uh, Otmar, who was the chair of uh, Working Group 3. Sorry. Uh, of the of the uh, working group three uh, and this uh, important uh, uh, report for for the Paris Agreement uh, and Herman, who was also a very a very well known um, um, advisor and, and and academic in in this area. So it's it's difficult to to add something, but let me let me focus on the on the external. Uh, importance of the UETS. I, I just uh, uh, had to, to comment, to, to, to write a, a book review for a, big, uh, for a major uh, energy journal uh, on carbon pricing. And, uh, and I was quite uh, upset because uh, the UETS was in a chapter called The Failure of Carbon Pricing. Right? They were analyzing you know, a lot of minor uh, experiences in Quebec, in California, and minor experiences in comparison to our. And, uh, and I, I think that the first thing that we have to do is to, 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 to claim the importance of our system, because um, I, I think it's quite successful in the sense that um, it's a very big in size, uh, remarkably big in comparison to the other uh, experiences that they were quoting in this book. Um, it was uh, facing a lot of constraints, both internal in the EU and also external constraints, uh, you know, countries that were not implementing similar policies. And I think that uh, it, faced it, it faced this uh, with a high degree of uh, adaptability, learning by doing, what we were uh, discussing many years here, and uh, I think uh, they are continuing to do, in, uh, to do this. And also, as, as Josh said, is, uh, is, uh, is a system with a huge international uh, influence. By the way, also, it's, it's very difficult to comment on, on, the, on the system with Jos here, who is, uh, you know, one of the most important per policy makers in, in, the, in, this, in, in this area, for sure. Um, so I would say that, uh, that some economists, some even academics, think that uh, this system uh, uh, may be a failure because uh, the low prices or volatility, but they forget about the other things that are a sign of, of a of a success. And, and in a way, I think that it is an exception to the difficulties of carbon prices. And uh, I, I agree with Marty that, uh, that we had to, 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 to be proud of having this idea and, and to have this unanimity. But, but in a way, I think that most of us expected much more from this carbon pricing uh, by the 1990s. And, and the systems uh, that we have in, in place, um, I mean, they don't have a lot of coverage in countries, even in, in the countries sometimes they are quite partial, or even the levels are probably uh, less than what we expected. In, in this sense, uh, there is kind of a break between, or, or a gap between what we, we thought as academics and, and, and the real applications. And I think it's, 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 it's crucial also to, to, to mention that uh, carbon pricing is, is very important, not only because it's, uh, it's, uh, it saves costs, it's uh, uh, um, uh, both from an static efficiency point of view but, and also from a dynamic efficiency point of view, but also because it is crucial in transitions. I think that we have to stress this a lot. And it is crucial in transitions because uh, uh, it creates the atmosphere for innovation, for changes both in companies, in, in households, and also uh, because I think that it can make these transitions viable, feasible, uh, through, uh, you know, perhaps exemptions to some sectors, uh, using the, the revenues to compensate others. I think that we have to claim this. And, uh, and that's why uh, it is very important to support the UETS, because I think it's, uh, it's the most relevant carbon price uh, we have a lot of uh, knowledge uh, about things that worked and didn't work, and I think that we have to to, to focus on, on, on this, right? Um, 
Um, one more thing, and perhaps we are not very aware of this, but uh, the window of opportunity is closing. And it's not closing because the uh, climate catastrophe is around the corner or whatever, or that we have uh, you know, a kind of a, a limited budget of, of, of carbon. I think that the, the window of, of opportunity for, for climate policies is closing in the sense that we won't have uh, flexibility in the future to introduce uh, policies, in the sense that we will go more for uh, central planning or, or, or to very, very restrictive uh, mitigation approaches. And um, if we don't act uh, now at a global level, uh, this will happen for sure. Uh, and therefore, that's why the EU ETS is so important, because uh, if we, through the, the, the work of Florence, for instance, the Florence process, um, uh, interacting with other countries, and also knowing what are the, 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 you know, the, the best research to advance in this, uh, can contribute to this. Because uh, you know, I, I think that sometimes, uh, and we are also uh, seeing this at the moment, sometimes we are forgetting about the, 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 the window of opportunity that for climate policy is, is closing. And look what we are seeing now, the new Green Deal, um, you know, prohibitions everywhere. The, there is no carbon pricing in these new, new approaches. Thanks, Javier. And, and that brings us to the question uh, that we are going to take up in the next session, that is, can we raise our voice for market-based approaches uh, in, in, the, in the future of climate policy. So uh, thanks for reminding us. Our last intervention is from uh, Aldo Ravazzi. Aldo, um, uh, lots of options are on the table already to improve trust. Uh, go ahead, you have the floor. Thank you, Jos. Not easy to speak in front of the father of the uh, EU ETS, but we will try. Uh, three rounds of negotiations and reform, exemptions, prorogations, grandfathering, uh, Problems of free distribution of quotas, national egoism and nationalism have been at the center of the building of EU ETS. Still, this is a fantastic construction. It's the first time ever that a market is built with something like 450 or 500 million people. So we had some experiences in USA, but only in some states or groups of states, only for some elements, gases, emissions of different kinds. Uh, to do such a, a fantastic intellectual challenge uh, and being able to, to, to build such a market, I think, should be uh, looked with respect and, uh, and gratitude. We risk to lose uh, uh, credibility, obviously, because when it's so long, it is a problem. But we know the problems which are here behind. Uh, I would not like also to uh, forget that I'm also in front of a co father of a carbon energy tax, which was mentioned earlier with Frank Convery, Jos Del Beke, with Frank Convery, Alberto Maiocchi, Jacques Delors himself, and some other economists in '92 were already ready with a European Union carbon energy tax. And they were ready to go to Rio, Rio 92, the original Rio, able to say Europe has already taken action and, uh, and uh, a carbon energy tax. Regrettably, there was the English finger, sorry, the British finger coming out, and we still have a problem of unanimity, which will not be solved by possible Brexit, because we have Polish fingers and Hungarian fingers around, which are ready to raise up and say, this is taxation, we don't want to decide altogether. It's a pity. But this reminds also to us that we are talking of a price on a market and not of a tax, even if we all believe that market-based instruments are, are useful for ambitious environmental policies. Uh, this takes me to the idea that maybe an analogy can be useful is the analogy with the property tax. Uh, all of us who has uh, the, the, the luck to have a property, a house or whatever, we pay generally in our countries, not in all countries, but generally we pay uh, a tax on the property itself. And this doesn't prevent to have a market for buying and selling houses and properties. So I think in the same way we can have a ETS which uh, is promoted and, uh, and uh, progresses and at the same time have a carbon tax even on the same sectors. The idea of tax duplication is a false problem in my understanding that we should not accept. We can do that, and some countries do. Uh, many uh, people, many so-called experts against carbon pricing have used it to try to avoid any form 
of carbon pricing. This was my first point. My second point is that expectations are absolutely uh, fundamental and uh, certainly we uh, solidify the resistance of the European uh, bureaucrats in the best meaning of the word has been uh, basic for, for building this credibility. You have resisted and some of us with you. Uh, certainly the price on the market doesn't look satisfactory when we look at uh, Sweden where we have a, a carbon tax of 130, 170 or when we look at uh, colleagues by, of IMF who says we should go up to 400, 500. Uh, euro or dollars per, per ton, uh, we, are, we are far from that, and even some of our countries are, have done better than the, the present uh, 25. But certainly there is a change of pace and the credibility uh, coming from the Paris Agreement and from Agenda 2030 on sustainable development at United Nations have helped to create this atmosphere, this uh, um, environment uh, uh, which is in, in favour of credibility. Uh, look at what is happening in green finance, in sustainable finance, with the development of a number of instruments of green bonds, private and public, in trying to integrate climate uh, like in France, but now also at European level. We have in Italy set up an Italian observatory on sustainable finance. We are seeing a lot of things which are moving and probably expectations are growing. New generations coming in power, new generations coming in responsibility in corporates. This might help. My third point is along what Herman was saying, uh, we have to look at things in a, an integrated way. So the implicit carbon tax, the implicit carbon prices, the analysis by OECD is extremely useful from this point of view. We have excises, we have energy, electricity tax, fuels taxes with very different name and we should uh, uh, look at this to understand how the price is working. The contribution of the carbon pricing leadership coalition served by World Bank or uh, of think tanks like Green Budget Europe, which I happen to chair, or the Institute of European Environmental Policies on these things is extremely important. Also, there is a question of uh, subsidies because we can take the same problems from other, other sides and the G20 peer reviews on fossil fuel subsidies might be a difficult exercise but which help to keep attention on pricing and carbon pricing. Uh, when I read the USA Economist Declaration, I find it very interesting. Uh, maybe the uh, AIR, the European Association, might think of launching something similar. I'm thinking of uh, uh, an Economist call which was prepared uh, uh, in view of the Paris Agreement and that some of us signed calling for a carbon price, whatever form, ETS or tax, and calling also for a world carbon price, which I'm not so sure but we can ever find the word carbon price because uh, it's a different price in each country, in each sector and uh, we don't see any world price, I'm afraid, in any sector. Aviation is considered a, a world market but we don't see an aviation price and uh, <coughs> certainly we have also uh, problems with oil price which is considered a world price but it is not. Do I have one more minute as we are in Italy, Jos? Uh, uh, we <laughs> Uh, we don't have much. We, we don't have much discussion on carbon taxation. I'm afraid in our country, the two parties in government, uh, the League, is asking for a radical decrease of fuel taxes, and the Movement Five Stars is asking for eliminating uh, environmentally harmful subsidies. These are the two only official positions which were before the formation of the government. At the same time, we prepared an energy and climate plan proposal where we propose to cancel the uh, coal plants. We have two working fully, and seven which or called from time to time in case of emergency. We've prepared at the Ministry of Environment the first catalogue of environmentally harmful subsidies and environmentally friendly subsidies, which has been uh, quite uh, uh, analysed by some experts. And the second is coming out in these very days, finally. It was ready <coughs> last year, but there were some political problems, and we are preparing the third. And finally, we have a project on environmental fiscal reform in Italy and the European Union, which has been approved by the European Commission. The Secretary General has this program <coughs> for uh, structural reform support, and uh, we've been able to, to, to have this project approved, and I hope it will be uh, another place where we can talk about the coalition of the willing, the like-minded countries, which might be an important approach to go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also this morning when the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Italy was uh, addressing uh, the conference, uh, he uh, 
he was pleading for an own resource in the European Union and inter alia he was also mentioning climate change and uh, uh, and, 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 and a fiscal base uh, of, uh, in that respect. But it was inter alia, there were many others uh, mentioned. So if I just, uh, before I open the floor for more reflections, I, I think I have five proposals to improve the trust on the EU ETS by way of squaring you know, things a little bit together. I think that the first one uh, was to create more price certainty through minimum prices. That was Otmar's strong argument. Then Herman said, let's strengthen the cap. So we have the prices versus quantities debate, you know, very lively uh, there. Uh, the third element was perhaps we need a coalition of the willing of some uh, member states uh, moving forward. Uh, but, uh, you know, then we have to address the waterbed effect, you know, within the same European cap. The fourth element was, I think, Dominique stressing the analogy with the uh, effort sharing regulation. I think also Otmar was uh, going into that. Um, uh, and we have not yet been dwelling into whether the effort sh uh, sharing regulation that opens the possibility for trading between states or parts of the effort sharing regulation could also be brought under the ETS. I yeah, know that that's an idea about transport that several member states have uh, uh, brought as an idea on the table but not yet uh, formulated proposals on. And uh, the fifth element is the distributive questions, you know, uh, impacts, how to use the revenues to compensate for those who have a more difficult um, uh, adaptation uh, process. So we have, in, as a form of categories, you know, these five uh, families of, of commons that uh, we were having. I wonder whether there were more questions uh, from from the floor. Okay. Um, and, and I give the floor to Otmar and I have Stefano and I have uh, any other person who would like to make an intervention and uh, Simone uh, coming back. And in front, I, I also have a question. So um, I, I start with, with Otmar. You know, uh, there is a burning comment you wanted to make, uh, Otmar. No, I, I want, I want to, to clarify some things. In particular, what is the agreement and the disagreement with Hermann? First of all, I have no doubt that the cap has been delivered. And, and that's, that's for sure. And this is the big success story of the EU ETS. And I'm not saying, my argument is not um, I want to have a higher price because I'm not happy with the price. And, and I'm, my argument is also not we should strengthen the cap. So let's for a moment the cap is given. Even, even if we are happy with the cap, my argument is uh, the purpose of an emission trading scheme is twofold. Delivering the cap, but also to incentivize an appropriate intertemporal pricing scheme for investments. And I'm challenging the first one. And what I'm saying is when basically the trust in the system is undermined because of several reasons. Might it be the business cycle, might it be because of political announcements. So then there's a tendency that the investments are postponed into the future. And this basically people anticipate that in the end when the cap is given, there might be a sharp increase in the price. And then people might speculate if the policy makers have sufficient commitment to stick to this cap despite of the uh, uh, sharp increasing price in the future, and this destabilizes the expectations. This is my argument. It's not my argument that let's talk about the cap, ju just to make this sure. The second aspect is on the water bed effect. So the nice thing is I have the same modeling framework like, like Raya and, and, and others, and my feeling is the disagreement here is how to, to, to understand the market stability reserve in the proper way. But this is indeed a technical aspect. Even if we have some disagreement here, what I'm saying is uh, the minimum price is a hedging strategy. So if, if you give at least my analysis a very low probability, so you cannot challenge then the minimum price. And the last thing is, this is something which I would like to emphasize what you said. I'm very much in favor of the willingness uh, of the coalition of the willing. However, this amplifies the waterbed effect and therefore a coalition of the willing has to be complemented by some kind of a minimum price to mitigate at least the waterbed effect. Again, as a hedging strategy. Or, or by a correction of the cap. I mean, if you have a coalition of the willing, either you have a minimum price or you correct the cap. Uh, but, but the waterbed effect is there. 
because there's a European cap and nobody cares which country is covering what kind of installations uh, inside the cap. Herman? Um, actually, uh, I think we, we, we do agree. Uh, I, I've been supporting the whole, the whole concept of a minimum price for a long time. Uh, so on that point, uh, I totally agree, and, and it's, it's about expectations, for sure. But in my view, the MSR and the, and the way in which um, the cancellation policy has been designed um, is uh, making the whole evaluation different. So uh, it seems that these expectations, and of, of course, firms, uh, I totally agree with Martin's observation that we cannot fool everybody all the time. Uh, and we are certainly not fooling the industry. The industry knows very well. The industry is well aware. My, my point was th the industry may be aware, but the rest of society isn't. Even the specialists are not. Uh, but the industry knows, and they, uh, they are, in, in terms of their investments, they look at price expectations. Fully agree. And they, they find uh, f follow hedging strategies. But the essential point is, if the MSR works together with a cancellation policy, which, uh, and that's also a theory point, I think um, you are basically creating a sort of minimum price through a quantity uh, instrument. So you're adapting in the quantity field exactly the same kind of uh, effect as the minimum price would do. And that's what we observe in the market. And, and, and that makes me wonder, and that's, that's why it's open a question, it's an open question for me, uh, because it's relatively new also in my view, whether the minimum price concept survives the idea of uh, market cancellation policy, which is working through the quantity side. Yeah? Here we have an, an agreement. Okay. Uh, here we have an agreement. It depends on the, in, in the end, all, everything depends on the cancellation policy. Exactly. And what I'm saying is, uh, observing the German policy, the cancellation policy is not very well implemented. And, and I would like to see the, the minimum price as a hedging strategy against this, because cancellation is, is a thorny thing. Okay, then it seems that we, we are we, going... We are, we are converging. May I disturb a little bit the conversion? <laughs> you know, because the market stability reserve is doing two things. First, it is taking the surplus of the out of the market and puts them in a reserve, in a fridge. And if those um, allowances are for longer than three years in the fridge, then they are being cancelled. So there are two elements. There is taking out and after a period of time cancelling. Yeah. Where I have a, a criticism on Otmar's uh, concept is that the cancellation is unilateral by a member state, while the MSR is a European harmonised policy. And if I would now uh, take your argument, Otmar, and extrapolate it, then the harmonized instrument of the EU ETS would become driven by member state policies. And that is a concept where we have to be very uh, much uh, alert on. If it happens once or twice, okay. But if every single member state starts making their decisions and tomorrow we take out X tons and the day after another number of tons, uh, then you could have expectations that are going wild because you mentioned the political decisions, but then the, the marketeers, the market speculators are going to speculate on the next comment and decision that is going to be made by a government X or Y or even a local government, etc. So, uh, you know, you have a harmonized policy and I think we have a merit in addressing the solutions in a harmonized manner uh, or in a European manner, uh, to put it more, uh, precisely, otherwise it is driven by unilateral decisions and it could break up a harmonized policy that is uh, currently in place. That's, a, that's new for me, so the cancellation policy is not an EU decision. No. It's, it's just the member states who, who well, well, can decide. Can, the cancellation of the market stability reserve is harmonized to the extent it is in the directive, that means a number of allowances that is there for three years are being taken off the market, you know, for a couple of years. That is harmonized, that is agreed by all 28 member states. But now, what Otmar was uh, suggesting was a possibility that is raised in the directive that when an additional coal mine is being cancelled, that then the corresponding member state cancels 
the allowances corresponding with it. And that is a unilateral decision and a unilateral correction of the, of the cap. And, and that is a, a different you know, way of approaching things and, and I would rather prefer that we continue for reasons of competitiveness and things like that with a harmonized policy and not with one that is driven by unilateral national actions. But that's, that's a, but, a, a design issue. But, uh, but, but without monopolizing the test, but this is exactly, so for me, it, it would be, so first of all, there, there's a full agreement here. And then the question is, basically to what extent Germany, for example, will now cancel the permits coming or caused by, by, by the coal phase out. And what I'm saying is here basically, the market stability reserve cannot address this because this is just the waterbed effect in time, not the waterbed effect in space. And if there is no cancellation, there will be a significant water space, waterbed effect in space, number one. The second one is exactly what you are saying is, my, my analysis is you cannot avoid in the European Union uh, any sort of unilateral action because there is always a wish of, of, of member states. And the only thing what I'm saying is a minimum price to a certain extent could deliver so this harmonized thing because to a certain extent this would allow countries, if the price is, is above the minimum price, at least to do some unilateral action because there will be always some unilateral action. And then you need, I fully agree with you, you need a stabilizer in the system. Otherwise, speculators will come up with very, very wild expectations. So I fully share this point of view. Okay. Well, lots of things to discuss and to think about. Dominique. Yeah. Just uh, on this point, uh, uh, a sentence. I think that the fact that uh, some uh, member states want to cancel unilaterally some allowances, or the fact that some member states want to add taxes on the, on the carbon price of the EU ETS, remains in itself uh, a warning of something goes wrong in the functioning of the ETS. So I think that I don't choose between the different theses, but I think that in a good system, we should not. Uh, we should try to to solve the problem at the harmonized level. And see when the problem exists, I think it reveals so, uh, a certain problem that we must address. To, to, uh, which is a problem of trust in the ETS in the long term. I think. Okay, but because indeed you can have lots of gaming between member states then starting, you know, one member state waiting for Germany to do the thing, you know, and then them themselves not having to do uh, part B of the story. But, you know, it would uh, drive us far uh, too far. I had Stefano and I have uh, you on my list and then I have Simone. And let's take the three and then we, we close the discussion. Stefano. Yes, my comment relates to Professor Weizmann's uh, mentioning of the label cap and tax in the US. And uh, I think that is an oversimplification that is okay for the general public. But uh, let's not forget the fundamental difference between a cap and trade system and a carbon tax. With the first, the long-term quantitative objective of emissions reductions is guaranteed. With the second, uh, no, if you want an optimal carbon tax, then you have to work out the marginal cost, cost of carbon and good luck. So. The long-term obje uh, quantitative objective. Okay, I, I, gi I give uh, uh, you know the possibility to come back. You first. Um, um, thanks. You tell us your name. Sorry, I did Alessio, not. Alessio Alessio D'Amato from the University of Torquegada. Um, my question is very quick. Um, I, I suspect that the credibility of the UETS also comes from the ability of the system to achieve close to full compliance, which at the moment has been obtained also thanks to low prices in some periods and surpluses in the current period, which may hide the problem in the future if um, scenarios predict very high price increase under any of the policy options. So I was wondering and I would like to ask whether there is some the, some hints or some thoughts may be done concerning whether resources for compliance should be increased in the future for granting full monitoring and full compliance should be increased in order to face increases in the likelihood that firms try to be non-compliant due to larger prices. 
I can have, give a quick reply to that. The penalty rate is 100 euros per ton. So for a company, it's much more attractive to, to procure themselves with the allowances on the market instead of paying the penalty. Because uh, uh, that is one of the, the hidden, I think, uh, treasures of the ETS system, that the penalty is so high that uh, the drive towards uh, compliance is almost uh, total. You know. And, and these were paid by some aviation airlines who were in breach of the regulation and you know, the penalty was paid and next year they didn't happen it again. You know. Simone. I'll be very brief, uh, but I would like to shift the attention to the last two points of the five points that you mentioned, Joss, because there were the, the topic of asymmetric treatment and distributional effects. I think these are the main obstacles to the credibility of the UTS. I think that uh, the ETS needs to be extended somehow. Maybe uh, this sounds provocative because we have problems with the UTS, we know. But uh, one problem is the very fact that some sectors are out and are completely you know, ignored and they have different treatment. So this asymmetric treatment generates a problem of credibility. And the other problem, in my view, is a distributional effect. I mean, this is linked to the previous point. As long as there is a feeling that there is a different treatment and an equal treatment, we will not be able to convey the value of the UTS to the, to the general public. And for this, we should insist on the revenues, on the fact that the UTS raises revenues that can be used to address the regressive problems. A very important point. I think uh, you know that uh, uh, is also going to be addressed, and hopefully in the statement that uh, we are going to discuss. Any final comments from the panelists on uh, you know Dominique? Dominique, you want Just to? Just on, yeah. on this point about uh, regressive issues. Indeed, it's at the table in France today, and what we observe when looking carefully to this problem is that to tackle the distributive uh, problems we use all the revenues of the carbon tax indeed, because the problem is huge with uh, regressive, vertical uh, regressivity, but also heterogeneities and so on. And so the, the, if we want to tackle correctly distributive issues, we must make uh, compensatory uh, transfers, uh, a lot of compensatory transfers to, to avoid uh, losers, if we, cons if we want to keep incentives, so we must uh, to, to, uh, to make compensations. F final comment by Aldo and Herman, and then we close the session. Aldo. In Italy, we are using the proceedings of ETS auctions, half the Ministry of Environment for International Cooperation on Climate, and half Ministry of Economic Development, which is Energy and Industry for uh, Energy Efficiency. The question of uh, enlarging sectors is key. And obviously, you've been working and introduced the easiest sectors we have to work for. We should avoid to have the situation we had with aviation, which we reminds us that aviation, international aviation and international shipping are exempt from taxation on their fuels, whereas we all pay a lot of money and we are happy to pay it if there's an unfairness which is uh, to be dealt with. Very much so. Herman. It's an old discussion whether we should uh, expand ETS um, I think we have decided a uh, long time ago to have a hybrid system, and, I s and you see it here on the, on the picture of the Netherlands. And the reason to have a hybrid system is that uh, the, the, in terms of, uh, let's say, the organization of the system, so the transaction cost of uh, expanding ETS is high relative to what we are doing now. Uh, that's the first reason. Uh, you are going to tackle uh, small-scale um, uh, emission persons who, who um, are emitting, and we have already schemes in, in, in uh, active schemes, which you see here, which are the taxes. Basically what you do is undermining these taxes if you expand uh, uh, ETS, and um, then you have an even more difficult discussion about uh, fuel taxes, uh, and that's one of the reasons that I'm not in favor of this. And, and actually yeah. what is also important, and, and that has been mentioned several times, Indeed, I think the grandfathering to industry is the, is the key to change the rules. Uh, I think that in terms of distributional impact, you can very easily explain to the general public 
Also, the, in the industry is contributing, not now, but uh, if they are going to, uh, to pay their auctioned rights, we are doing our best and we are doing uh, a good job as well. Yeah, because it's also from, uh, okay. you can uh, support that with, with many, uh, let's say, serious uh, economic research which supports that. I think that, 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 would, that would be very important for the distributional discussion. Okay, so addressing the free allocation. Okay, it's not grandfathering because it's benchmark based, uh, the other free allocation. Ben, you want to, a very brief comment because we are wildly over time, so it seems. Yeah. Thank you, Pardon. No, just um, if you ask the public uh, about their favourite climate policy, uh, tax, carbon taxes come bottom of the list, unless uh, they know what's going to happen to the revenues. That really improves the, the public's opinion of, of these policies. The, the other thing I, I would say is a quick plug for the UK policy on climate change. Um, I mean, like so many other things about Brexit, we don't really know what's going to happen. But uh, Today, the Climate Change Committee has released a report which has made more stringent the targets that the... Uh, it's recommended that the targets become more stringent in the UK, carbon neutral by uh, 2050 instead of an 80% reduction. I recommend you have a look at the strategy there that's been, that's been released today. Very good. So, uh, there is life in the brass. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think we had a, a very lively discussion and I took... Uh, very interesting points uh, from it. And you see there is work for economists to reflect and to elaborate further ideas that policymakers then can test on the ground and make uh, compromises about and, and have the majorities that we all require, which is ultimately the support we are looking for and support comes from trust in the system. So thank you very much. I uh, close now and we come back already at 1.30. Uh, Simone, it's in the other room. Okay, for those who are invited uh, to the, the POC committee, it's in the other room, and please take your stuff with you. Okay, thank you very much, and see you soon.